be reading are from my pamphlet, which Jenny mentioned, um, Naming Bones by Ignition Press. Um, it's very nice because I can see my editor for this, Claire Cox, at the bottom of my screen. Hi, Claire. <laughs> Um, and then some will be poems that have been po um, published more recently. Um, and it was very interesting thinking about the theme of threats. So I've tried to look at my work and think how can I approach that theme um, from kind of different angles. So I wanted to start with um, some poems about uh, motherhood because I write quite a lot about motherhood and I certainly found that new motherhood felt very threatening. Um, the threats to your sense of self, the threat to my self-confidence um, and I think it's just a time you become aware of danger a lot more than you were before. Um, so this first one is about uh, the day I found out that I was going to um, have a baby. So it's called No Blood in Ikea. The day we found you were coming to us we drove to Ikea. We knew the route, the dusk of Harrow, but the landmarks had shifted. There is no blood in Ikea. Cells do not divide against the clean white surfaces. Cows do not bellow on all fours on the beds with imaginative storage. The returns department, while inefficient, is operational. Homeward, sideboard bungee to the roof rack. I thought of the road uncoiling in the dark between us. It seemed a long way to travel. Later, wired for the section. They told me it would feel like dishes being done in my belly. I tried to think of the kitchens with soft closed doors, the rows of stainless sinks. Amaran, Langudden. Um, and the second one is um, about the first night after my um, baby was born, my daughter, and it's called Fontanelle, which for anyone who doesn't know is the absolutely terrifying, very soft bit on the top of a baby's head. Fontanelle. I want to tell you there has been a mistake. You have left your heart too close to the surface. It beats just under that smear of hair, the skin's unbearable sheen. All night it ticks, alien, molten, a stop clock I didn't mean to set, that will go off at three with a flayed, outrageous shriek. The hospital car park will be red soon, raw and unlikely as the very first morning. All the calm blue concertina curtains can't keep me in. Your skull is the world at the dawn of time, spinning in a ward of infant stars, tectonic plates still shifting. There has been a mistake. They have left my heart in a plastic cot for anyone to look at. It is smaller than I thought, more helpless and more beautiful. And this one um, is about the uh, nightmare of breastfeeding, well, nightmare for me at least. On understanding the gods. Again, I offer you my breast, the globe I've made for you blue and rivered with milk. Again you turn away and wail instead for the small injustice of your life. Claw your tiny hands at the stars. I do not know how I can make you love the things I want to give you. We fail together, over and over. This God and her creation, in my trying to help you, and you not wanting to be helped until my nipples are wounds and you are drinking blood. I have made you in my image, love. I will watch you from up here. All my rash and tender fury is yours. Um, 
Um, and then I wanted to go back um, further, back into um, kind of childhood, um, youth, because I think for me, um, there's a lot of kind of vague sense of threat when you're young, because I think, I don't know whether it comes from powerlessness or sometimes actually maybe at the time you didn't see it, but then looking back, you can see the threats that were there. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna share a few from that time. So this one's from, from school. Doing the heart in lower five. We try not to think of the cows, the empty churches of their chests. Their hearts are grey now, filmed and tubed, bigger than two fists. And the air smells like we've swallowed money, like we've licked the edge of a knife. My partner retreats to the sick room, so I probe alone. Fingers where the blood should be, aorta a handless glove. The valves are bell tents, like Christian Union camp in the RE teacher's garden. Each ventricle a mouth that opens again and again when I squeeze it. The preacher from St Matthew's telling us he can help us speak in tongues. It's heavy, this meat, this sight of love we haven't felt yet. And I wonder if the cow did, if the beating quickened for the bull for the wet, slicked nose of its calf. The notes in my drawing are neat, mitral, tricuspid, inferior vena cava, as if I'm striking a bargain with knowledge, like the words will keep me safe. Then it's break, and we can wash our hands, drop our hearts in a bucket, like the babies in the abortion video they made us watch. Let the porter cabin, its swollen walls, pump us out into the light. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for asking me to read. And you couldn't have had a more perfect subject because my book is called Threat. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that, that was very satisfying. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off by reading some poems about family and often there's one like dominating person in a family who who brings the sense of threat with them and in this family it's the father saturday afternoons he nods off in front of the boxing the fog of smoke round his head even the cats shooed from the room not a thought in his head but the blissful quiet nicotine brain the roar of the crowd, a brown ale to warm the cockles, not an aggravation of a child in sight. Meantime, we creep around the house, barefooted thieves trying hard not to make a noise, mothers at the bottom of the stairs, glaring finger to her lips, or in the kitchen kneading onion into bright pink worms of mince the orange slime of egg yolk, the little ones begging a treat, me, book open on the table, reading, someone, somewhere, in a headlock, someone's lights punched out. Brewing. In the dark, Aggie Scragbag hears Ma and Pa splitting the night open with sawtooth words and up creaks the stink of something brewing. Something she sees when she sneaks downstairs, bubbling in its giant plastic bucket, waiting to go into the barrel with the leaky tap. When he sees her in the doorway, Pa does an angry dance. Aggie hot foots it up the stairs and bangs her bedroom door, lays between Jaffa orange walls and prays for the star people, the ones that crocheted the sky, to come to her window and take her back. But though she pokes her head up beneath the net curtain, the flat roof outside stays resolutely empty. 
that one was in part inspired my dad used to make homebrew in the days before you could buy kits so <laughs> it involved um stewing hops and um roasting roast roasting barley i think and the, the house i really hated the smell of stewing hops it was horrible <clears throat> She was a biscuit barrel, or barrel shaped at least, as he kept reminding her. The bucket he kicked splashed lemony water up the wall, her face a crumpled tissue on the floor. The dog was whining outside the locked back door. The TV was querulous and mundane. The shopping was waiting to be packed away. The kettle was whistling on the stove. A child was shuffling on their bottom down the stairs. She was a biscuit barrel, though whether empty or full was unclear. He was a barrel full of vinegary homemade beer, his contents leaking out across the floor. A child had shuffled down the stairs and let the dog in. In the other room, the TV blared. The shopping was defrosting in the pushchair's tray. The kettle was still whistling on the stove. She was a biscuit barrel, mopping the kitchen floor. He was cursing the kettle and the dog, shouting through to turn the TV off or else. His mood was vinegary and cold. The shopping was scattered across the floor. The dog was whining in the hall. A child was crying in the downstairs loo. The house was quarrelsome and sly. <clears throat> I just check that you can hear me all right. Fabulous. <clears throat> so I'm going to read some that are about um, being a teenager now and i mean i grew up in a small in a small town but and um it seemed like threat lurked on every corner really in various guises but um i that probably is the same wherever you live i guess so i'm going to start um one of the things we did a lot of as teenagers was we hung out in the public toilets. We hung out in the loos at school, hiding from various kinds of threats, bullies, teachers, and also we went there to smoke and, you know, sort of naughty stuff like that. But me and my friend often used to sky to school and go into the bus station toilets because nobody else ever went there. So it felt like our little clubhouse bus station toilets after Jen Hadfield. Meet me at hideout, hidey hole, hidden, our own little kingdom. Meet me with a marker pen, half a pack of players, roll on cherry lip gloss in a flowery glass bottle. Meet me in the cubicle with his initials inside an arrowed heart. We'll ask the walls about Mary and why she is a whore. Meet me at our secret place behind the bus station, opposite the courthouse door for boys on probation. Meet me at damp cement, Eisel, Jay's fluid. Meet me by the cracked sink and the broken soap dispenser. Meet me at tears fall, rain shelter, conference room. Meet me there as soon as you can and tell no one where you're going. <clears throat> so. Because my hometown has a hand between its legs, we spend too much time in public toilets smoking, scratching boys' names onto cubicle doors. Imagine the shock of touching a pickled egg buried deep inside his hot wrapper of chips. No myths here, only rumours. Streets you can't walk down because you have been warned off. Boys, it's best not to look at. Spaces find you, 
the concrete slope under the road bridge, the shadowy space beneath the walkways at the bottom of the flats. You'd rather lie through your teeth than confess your sins. You might get a good hiding, or your friend would stop being your friend. There's a spy hole in the wall of your best friend's bedroom through which her brother watches her get undressed. Shake off the boy on the push bike at the edge of the estate. Make sure your mum's friend never gives you a ride home alone. <clears throat> this is true about the spy hole. <clears throat> the language of home hurts my mouth. This one is this one is really about how you can leave your hometown but your hometown never really leaves you. The language of home hurts my mouth. It spies on me in the night, peering in through the letterbox. Though I left years ago it hasn't let me go. When I was six it tied a bit of elastic to my ankle so I would always bounce back again. When I was ten it inked its name on the insides of my thighs enjoying slipping its hand between my legs. This is how it is with us, me running, it pouncing. Mostly it speaks in screeches, the rising voice of accusation. My hometown doesn't have an S, an A or any other friendly letter. All its sounds are hard. Weeks and months go by now where I barely say its name, but its language lives inside me spills out at odd moments as fucks and cunts, a whole town teeming with swear words. Beyond that, the shush of pines, shoulder to shoulder silence, shoulder to shoulder dark. <laughs> the next thing I'm going to read, I think, speaks really to um, one of the poems Joanna read, and it's only a short poem, but it's, it's, it's made up of a lot of things that friends of my mum felt it was okay to say to me when I was a teenager. The Moth. He says, and actually before, yeah, think, when I was thinking about what Joanna said when she was reading her poem was that, um, that, that those predatory older men would make it feel like it was your fault that they were preying on you somehow. The moth. He says, you are a looker like your mum. And he says, wowee, look at the pins on that. You are ripening like an autumn fruit. And he says, when you are 16, I will take you to the woods. I can't resist. And my wife's not interested in sex since the second child was born. And he says, it's not fair. Young girls are so good looking nowadays. And he says, you'll be a heartbreaker one day. The boys will come flocking like moths to a flame. So I, I don't know if it's the same now, but there was certainly a lot of predatory older men lurking around when I was a teenager. We used to go to the pub and, and you know, we, we quite liked the attention because we didn't really know any better. I think sometimes you only recognise the threat when you're looking back on it. Um, so this one, my friend Chris had an uncle, although Recently, when I was rereading this poem, I thought, was it really his uncle? I'm not sure. And he taught us how to smoke. Gold Rabbit is teaching me how to smoke. He tells me to hold the cigarette between my fingers just so. You are lucky to have a rabbit like me, he says, his paw on my knee. I am such a gentleman. I love Gold Rabbit, but his constant crunching gets on my nerves, his lust for green, the way he sees things that aren't there. I draw the hot smoke across my tongue and down deep 
into my lungs. It scorches my throat and I cough it out. Gold Rabbit wags his carrot at me, his ears twitching. It's not ladylike to suck so hard, he says. You need to be more delicate. Sometimes I wish it was Jade Rabbit I had brought home. <coughs> so I'm just going to finish up with three more recent poems. They're quite short. Um, and the first one, they're, they're poems written in lockdown. And when I was thinking about threats, I thought one of, one of my biggest threats is myself, I think. And um, certainly during lockdown, um, I kind of comfort ate and put on weight and, you know, it really wasn't good for me. And this is about that. I am a monument to bread. I have become the house of a hoarder. In these indoor days, I am eating my way to the beech and trees, the wide open spaces. My body is a city and every space is built on. I am full to bursting with bricks and mortar. And so many people, they give me indigestion. Kissing, fighting, holding hands. I wake at 3 a.m. in a pool of sweat and swallow the house, the moon, the garden, trying to fill the hole they've left. And then I swallow myself. No chewing. <clears throat> I spent lockdown, um, I live with my grown up son and we generally get on pretty well, but when you're cooped up in a house with someone and he's used to be me being away a lot more <laughs> than I am at the moment. So um, I think there's a kind of tension. I think everybody's felt that, you know, with their loved ones. So these last two poems I'm going to read are kind of about that. Decline. I am already on my second cup of English breakfast tea when you saunter in, wearing your unreadable face, your eyes narrowed to slits. I wait for the claws or the side swipe. But you are dolorous and slow, missing the little strokes and rubs the outside world can give you. Not much to purr about inside this lockdown house. It sends us dozy, sleepy with heat. You lie around the house, stirring occasionally to stalk something. A package, perhaps, or a song you are writing. Revisiting the hunt and the pounce. Thanks for listening. This is my last poem. We had nothing but love for the bird he had become. So big and clumsy, his wings sweeping cups and plates off the table, ornaments from the sideboard, his nervous beak pecking holes in the sofa, that familiar trapped look in his eye. We decided to let him go. It's the kindest thing, we said, when we discussed it amongst ourselves at night. He needs his freedom. He needs to be among his own. But it was hard to make him go. This was his home after all. He had hatched here. We left the door open and retreated to the kitchen, but he didn't leave. On the day of the solstice, an impromptu gathering on the roofs opposite drew him to the window, brought forth a soft cooing. We opened the window so he could better hear them and he hopped out onto the ledge. When he returned, it was on two feet walking and we recognised him at once as the boy he had been. We were so pleased to see him. We threw open the doors and cheered. And um, I was in the church choir as well, but it's quite an evangelical church. And as a teenager, I found it quite difficult to come out as um, gay because of uh, that 
a very um, Christian, deeply, not just Christian, obviously, I've got lots of Christian friends, but like it was a very kind of evangelical, hardline um, upbringing that I'd had. And this poem kind of engages with that. There's some mild filth at the end, but it's only very mild. So don't be either um, <laughs> outraged or disappointed at the mildness of the filth on display here. <laughs> Flock of paper birds. I needed the God of my childhood to be useful. So I folded him, shaped his pages into wings. Cranes at first, then more challenging roosters, swallows, owls. I pinched edges, split clauses to make word plumage. I fractured Leviticus with pleats. Now toucans mount doves on the kitchen counter near an unholy pile of geese. Cloacas gaping, beaks jabbing everywhere. Birds plummet from shelves without bothering to flap. Remember nothing. Ink blurs, feathers yellow. They drown in baths, rip luridly, turn up mangled in the hallway, footprints across their necks. Mostly, they're individuals, smoothly indifferent to each other's fates. Though now and then, some prop up neighbours if they topple. And when I lie with a visitor beneath my quilt, incubating his glorious buttocks, the flock discover their throats and sing together while I guide my tongue along warm creases and the tight sheet of his body unfolds. Um, how much time do we have? I'm going to read, maybe I'll just read two more poems. I'm going to finish um, on a more upbeat note with um, two of the love poems in the book. I've always written quite a lot of love poems. Um, I'm not sure why. I think my natural, I think I've always been slightly cursed with a natural tendency towards um, writing quite bouncy and optimistic poems, which is absolutely fatal for any writer and um, have to kind of steer myself into the dust. When I'm free writing, I'm generally quite um, happy and bouncy. I just, yeah, a lot of love poems come out and here are two of them. And this one, as you'll see, it's about a particular teapot that I, um, I own. Spout. Some months, all my thoughts are one colour. I hit a yellow mood and the world pours out its yokes. Tall stacks of National Geographic in Oxfam. Cranes that point uncertain fingers at the sky while maple leaves swoop into me and cling. Their veins like roads heading everywhere in fallen saffron cities. Then the teapot you saw on eBay had to have. It was like unpacking October and standing it on our table. It's yellow logic, strict yet plump, offering an outsized handle, a colour that might foster never-ending cups. We filled it with boiling water, our new sun, and that first time the copper rings around its centre made it tick, 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 as if letting us know it could wipe us out if it wanted to, but we'd been spared, that we could live beside it, they should be grateful for everything of its kind which travelled toward us all the yellow days. So I'm just going to read uh, one last poem from the book and um, this one is my her personal favourite in the book. It's actually quite an anxious love poem. Um, it's kind of got my underlying, um, I guess I, a, lot, a good poem for me is often about doubleness, so panic and beauty and anxiety and love here. 
and I wanted to read this one last partly because it's set at the beginning of September so it's a September poem so it's very appropriate and this is usually one of my favourite months because I get to go shopping for uh, stationery and so that introduces a lot of colour into my life as well as um, autumn itself um, bringing quite a lot of colour too. Anyway this poem is about um, yeah my beloved and it's set in Brighton where we live and that's probably about as much as you need to know but it's my final poem so thank you for um, listening to me. Uh, yeah the book is Reckless Paper Birds if you haven't got it already. Stationary. September is going all out to ease us in. The clouded sky is a whiteboard for helpful diagrams. The first cool air as welcome as your hand inside my jeans. Autumn zips round with its orange highlighter and you provide nifty shocks and marshmallows, leaving pornographic post-its that ask me to rendezvous, please, for hot chocolate. I am the type of man who likes unnecessary displays of manners, who appreciates thank you cards, warning signs, a forest of regretful notices for building works. I admire rows of ginkgos that lose all their foliage in one drop to form a yellow brick road. I am a desperate lion today, stalking scarecrow. I chew by rows, glimpse at my watch too often. I was so afraid of being late to see you once. I turned up six days early. Love is horrific like that. First it's a rabbit, then a duck, then it's a ravenous one-eyed sock puppet. But the rest is yogurt adverts and you fasten my thoughts with the most beautiful paper clips, even the filthy ones, like the time I saw a grove of ripening chili plants become a rainbow of penis trees. Do you wish to continue, says the voice of a self-service checkout. Yes, yes I do. Between the shops, the sea snuggles under its blue leaves. The clock tower waits patiently for Christmas. A familiar figure below it waggling his arms to lure me over. Succeeding. Your skillful face punches a giant hole in the day. And I jump through it. Thank you. <laughs> you feel um, is the relationship between writing and fear um, and whether you think that you have to feel fear in order to write a good poem um, and if you're ever afraid of your own poems. Um, yeah, I found an, a nice quote, somebody called Edmund Jab in the book of questions said, if you bend over your page and do not suddenly tremble with fear, throw away your pen. Writing would have little value. So, yeah, I was just wondering what you thought. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Shall I go first? <clears throat> um, I think a writer does need fear, actually. I don't think I always feel it when I'm, when I'm writing a first draft. I think for me the fear comes in the editing process and and when I'm thinking about sending work out and um, I think usually if I if a if a poem makes me feel a bit scared that's a good sign especially if I'm scared to show it to anyone <laughs> and then I might sit on it for a while and maybe show it to a, a, a close friend of close poetry friend first but um yeah there were definitely poems I was scared to put in my last book and one of those ended up being the sequence at the beginning but I was 
terrified of that poem. I think I think poems that have a that have a truth and are and are exposing are quite scary. That those are the ones I think that most resonate with readers generally. I don't know. What do you think? I think that poetry often is a vehicle for very um, difficult truths. Um, I was talking earlier on about simultaneity and how often you have like two competing things together, and often um, it's a, a, it houses um, things which we find um, difficult to say. And certainly when I'm free writing, I um, I often write down things that I've never uh, said aloud before, and then the idea of sharing that with other people means that sometimes there are poems where I've written something and I find it difficult to perform it, I think, the first time because I've never actually spoken with anyone about that. What do you, how, how about you, Joanna? Mm. Can we throw yeah. back the question? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I agree that I, I definitely feel like lots of the poems I write, I write them because I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to say what I'm writing. Um, and I think it's a way, because I guess I'm drawn to kind of, yeah, because I think poetry can be very complicated, can't you? You can deal with complicated things. Um, and I suppose what you were saying, John, about things that are double um, and things that are hard, you can kind of, yeah, um, grapple with them in, in a poem. So, um, yeah, I would say I, I often feel scared of my poems um, and that doubt of, oh, should I show them to anyone? Should I send them out? And all that weird thing of, oh, actually, I don't mind if complete strangers read them, but I don't want anyone I actually know to read them. Um, <laughs> feeling like I'll... Um... Easier to nerve a poem with um, depth and fear and that truthfulness if it is does kind of like resonate with something that I felt very strongly though I'd also um I mean there are many poems that I like that other people have written where the speaker is clearly not the author and is a construct of language and um I suppose I think there's room in the world for lots of different kinds of poems for different kinds of moods sometimes I want to be kind of shaken and sometimes I want to be comforted sometimes I want to be um, uplifted and sometimes I want to feel um, sad. Mm. I think that brings up that question about truth, truth in poetry, doesn't it? Because mm. I think a lot of my poems are autobiographical, especially in this most recent collection, but not, not everything in them is true. And definitely in my first collection, I remember somebody getting quite cross with me at a reading because she found out that one of my prose poems wasn't autobiographical <laughs> and she was very cross about it because it really resonated with her. But one thing I always say to my students is it's, you know, it's the, it's whether the poem feels true that's important. And if it resonates with you, then obviously it's, it, it is true on some level, whether it's a fiction or not. I've always found it slightly odd that fiction writers are allowed to make things up, but if it's in the form of a song or a poem, then it must be true. You couldn't possibly have put a, said a word which didn't literally happen um, because it just, yeah, it just, obviously the thing is to try to create something that's going to move a reader and if it makes it more moving for an outsider mm. for my front door to be blue rather than red, then I will change yeah. the colour of my front door in the poem to make it more moving for someone that doesn't know me because I don't really care what colour it literally, I hope they don't really care what the colour it literally is in reality. Yeah, I'd certainly take liberties with details like that. Like a poem I recently had published about my sister, I had to apologise to her. I said, I know that I had the red earmuffs and you had the blue earmuffs, but in the, in the poem, just had, I had to have the blue one, sorry. And, you know, it's, um, she's like, it's okay. But that's, so I, I take, yeah, I take liberties like that. But I think the truth, um, the truth of the feeling has to be true. Mm. Um, yeah. And certainly with some poems, I think like the one I read, the extract one, um, I'd feel like in a poem like that, I'd, I'd feel like it all had to be true because otherwise I'd feel like it was some kind of cheating, I don't know, cheating the reader, I think because you're leading them to think it's true and it, if it wasn't then I think I 
feel yeah like I would love for him to cheat but um yeah Even if the speaker is clearly not me, I know that my family will <laughs> latch on that. It's like, what are you saying about mum? What are you saying about your brother here? And it's like, that speaker's not me. It's a construct of language. And it is, it can be tough. I mean, I suppose I'm, I haven't written anything about my family in a negative light, I suppose. Um, but I have, like, yeah. Um, more recently, I've been writing about um, abuse and a relationship that I was in. And yeah, I have just change the name i suppose although they're obviously all resemblances to anyone living <laughs> are entirely <laughs> coincidental <laughs> mm. it is tricky isn't it when writing about people who are people who are alive and also like you said people want to read themselves in it i remember with my first book i had these prose poems which were very definitely a fictional family and my my dad said, yeah, but but you've got nylon sheets and we had nylon sheets and he was just absolutely fixated on it. And I had to explain to him about, you know, how you can how you can use concrete details from real life to make something more convincing. And then he kind of let it go. <laughs> but um, the poem I talked about earlier that I took out of my first collection actually was about my sister and I wasn't comfortable putting it in and then my son read it and he said you know it's it's not really horrible and it is all true so and it so it did go into this collection mm. but yeah it's it's tricky isn't it there are definitely poems I wouldn't that I've written that that wouldn't go in not while the people are alive anyway yeah the same here that I've read, yeah. But some I just feel like, I, and it's frustrating because I really like the, I like the poems and I think they're really good. Because <laughs> like, yeah. they're saying something really difficult, but I feel like it's just not, yeah, it wouldn't be fair because it's too obvious yeah. who it is. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard as well to know how people are going to read things because I, I sort of had to sit my mum down and say, oh, there's a poem, going to be a poem about you in a pamphlet and should probably read it because in, to my, in my mind it was really it was quite bad um but it's kind of it is quite metaphorical it's quite and then in the end she just she seemed a bit offended there was only one about her in the pamphlet so it's like <laughs> you can't you know it's hard to please people really or to know what their reaction is going to be um yeah I think it's um it's it's a sort of yeah, fine line, isn't it, between what's exploiting. I was shortlisted for the board ages ago, but I've only just got around to reading it. Can people see that one? It's called Fourth Person Singular by uh, Noir al Sadir, who's a psychotherapist, um, an American psychotherapist, and she writes these fragmentary um, prose poems um, about the self and the workings of the mind and um, yeah I find that really energizing I think it's a really good way of putting it Jenny like I find when I read a writer who I really resonate with it really energizes me and inspires me and makes me feel more creative um, I also particularly um, I've been going back to um, old uh, Wisława Zimborska, who won the Nobel back in the 90s, the Polish poet. Um, those, so those, are, those are two of my most recent ones. Obviously, I love Frank O'Hara, Anne Carson, Emily Dickinson. Enough from me, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've literally just finished this book, um, Love Minus Love by Wayne Holloway Smith, which I thought was fantastic. And interestingly, I saw he tweeted today that he um, that he thought it was his he wrote it as his epitaph, which I thought was quite interesting. And it is and it is it like none of the poems. It is like a sequence, and none of the poems have titles. But um, yeah, it's really good. I definitely recommend it. And um, I've also just read 
the, the rose metal press field guide to prose poetry which is really interesting and it ha it's american but you can buy it in britain and it has like an essay about prose poetry by lots of different writers and then one or two poems by them afterwards i think one of my favorite books of this year is sanatorium by abby palmer which I really enjoyed, which is kind of like somewhere between essay and poetry. And she went to Budapest. She, she has some kind of health condition that means she has chronic pain. So it's partly said she went to these thermal baths in Budapest where you have massage and then you go into the hot thermal baths. And then half of it is set in her flat where she's got this inflatable bathtub. And it's a lot about pain. It's quite weird, but I, I found it absolutely compelling. I, you know, I just couldn't stop reading it. Um, I have been very much enjoying um, Menagerie by Cheryl Pearson from the Emma Press. Um, just lovely animal themed poems and very beautiful, lots of lovely uh, illustrations. Um, Vicky Feather's new one. I want, I want. Um, and yeah, I just love her. And she always, every time I read her poems, I end up thinking, oh, I've got to write, I've got to write this and I've got to write that. And so she's very funny, very in inspiring. Um, and this I'm really enjoying as well. Um, Animal Experiments mm -hmm. from Bad Betty Press. Um, really, yeah, very, it's also very short, very kind of intense poems um, that aren't really about animals at all but well, kind of but yeah they're really I really I'm really really enjoying that um, yeah it's great Music